All right. Hello and welcome to um, the first of our two artist talks for, for COCA's um, current exhibition, Not Your Monolith. Um, Jake, I'm going to meet you really fast because I'm getting some feedback. Sorry. Um, as a friendly reminder, this talk is being recorded um, for use on our website and social media pages. So if you do not wish to be recorded or to appear on screen, please turn off your camera now. There is a little mute and a stop video button at the lower left hand corner of your screen. Um, Not Your Monolith aims to serve as a thoughtful push against preconceived no notions placed on BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Um, in particular, since we are an arts organization centered around um, BIPOC artists. Um, I would first like to thank our participating artist, Jake Prendez, the director and owner of uh, Napantla Fine Ar um, Nepantla Cultural Arts Gallery, I'm sorry, Tatiana Garmendia, from, who has been nominated through La Sala, and Michelle Kumada, who is nominated through the Asian Pacific Cultural Center. I would also like to thank all of our organizational partners, um, without whom we would not have been able to uh, put on this amazing exhibition, specifically Wanawari, Crow Shadow Institute of the Arts, La Sala, a Latinx artist network, Nepantla Cultural Arts Gallery, and the Asian Pacific Cultural Center. Um, all of these organizations were instrumental in this exhibition because they, that is how we were able to find and reach out and connect with all of our participating artists. And I would encourage all of our viewers to take a look at the art presented in the entire exhibition, which be, can be found on our website through our virtual viewing room and to vi visit each of our partnership organizations to find out more and about the organization specifically and uh, connect with even more artists um, who uh, are connected to those organizations. Um, so to start it off, I would like to, um, we're gonna ha have each of our uh, participating artist speakers talk a little bit about themselves, their artistic practices and their piece that's in this show. So we're gonna start off with, I'm gonna share my screen so that you're able to see, let's see. I'm doing this, this one. One, two, share. Larger and present. I'm going to take your still muted. Let's see. I can, un I can ask you to unmute, but I think you have to go to the little. Oh, there you are. All right. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Um, and my name is Jake Prendez, and I am the owner and co-director of the Nepantla Cultural Arts Gallery. Um, I'll first start a little bit about myself as an artist. I'll briefly talk about the Nepantla Cultural Arts Gallery. And since I'm actually here right now, um, I can give you a little uh, view tour of the gallery. Um, so I have lived my life in between um, California and Washington. I was born out by um, Riverside, California, a little town called Hemet, California, um, but was raised in Bothell, Washington. Moved there when I was about five. Um, and then after uh, college, I moved back to um, LA and I was, um, did my master's in uh, Chicano, Chicano studies at Cal State Northridge and um, ended up staying and um, was in LA for about 15 years and then moved back five years ago. Uh, my son got into the University of Washington um, and so his mom moved up with my daughter. I thought, yeah, both my kids are gonna be in Seattle. I'm just gonna move back. And it turned out to be probably the best decision I've ever made. Um, Seattle has just welcomed me with open arms. Um, I've really been embraced here. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've met, you know, my girlfriend and co-director of Nepantla, uh, Judy Alitia Gonzalez here in Seattle. Um, and the funny thing is she's actually from East LA. Um, so I joke around that I had to move to Seattle to meet an LA girl. But um, yeah, so I've been painting for about 12 years. I, you know, always paint or always drew and things like that as a kid. Um, you know, I sucked at pretty much every other subject in school other than art. And um, I had this undiagnosed dyslexia. So, you know, back then they just stuck me in special ed classes and things like that because I 
struggled in math and spelling and a lot of the things that just are harder for me because of dyslexia. Um, but art was that kind of one thing that I excelled at that uh, I, you know, seemed to people showed me some value in myself and all that. Uh, but by the time I was in high school, um, you know, I was drawing a lot of low riders and, um, you know, cholos and cholas and things like that. I, um, and I was a little cholo kid. Um, and, you know, they would have called me at risk youth, but, um, the art teacher would just, you know, told me literally, um, that my art was, you know, too gangster, too ethnic, but, um, you know, I heard, so the two gangster I heard a lot in high school and, uh, too ethnic. I heard when I, um, in college, when I had, I was going to do art and, you know, at community college, you know, it was just really discouraged and, um, so by the time I was about 19, I had just stopped doing art. I gave up art and I just pursued ethnic studies, concentration in Chicano studies, and then the master's in Chicano studies. Um, and it wasn't until I was doing my master's program and I was probably about 30 years old that I rediscovered painting. I took a class with Irena Cervantes, a famous Chicana painter. Um, it was a Chicano studies class, but it was a painting class. And I just fell in love with, um, art all over again. And, um, and then from there on out, I've been, you know, painting and, um, you know, kind of upset me, you know, I think back, you know, like what would have happened if I didn't listen to those negative people, you know, and I didn't have that 10 year gap of not creating art, like how good would I be now? Um, but I'm glad I rediscovered it. I'm glad I found my passion again. Um, and, you know, I, what, three years ago, I decided to be a full-time artist. Two years ago, decided to open the Napatla Cultural Arts Gallery and um, it's been a success and the community has really embraced this art center, um, our gallery. It, our gallery focuses on um, marginalized communities. So each exhibition, you know, we've had uh, Chingonas, which was an all women's exhibition. We've had uh, indigenous exhibition. We had a Pacific Islander exhibition. Uh, currently we have a youth art show. So all artists are 16 and under. Um, we've had um, a Lotaria show, a, you know, Frida Kahlo theme show. Um, but yeah, they've been successful. And before COVID, this place was absolutely packed when we would have our opening receptions and things like that. Um, but we're just thinking of creative ways to stay relevant. So we're, all our exhibitions are on our website. So you can view them virtually. You can also come in for people at a time with a mask and see the exhibitions in person still. Um, but, uh, you know, we're also the workshops and things like that, that we were doing, um, we're filming workshops right now. We just filmed about five workshops. They're being edited and we're going to put them on our YouTube channel. So regardless of where you are, you'll be able to view, you know, those workshops and do them from home. So we're still trying to think of ways to kind of stay relevant in this climate. Um, but let me see if I can, yeah. I'm going to flip the screen real quick and, um, sorry. Is there a way I can, can everyone see the gallery? I can't see. <laughs> we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I can just see kind of the, uh, the PowerPoint or the screen, but so this is, um, all the, this is all my artwork basically, oh, thank you. Um, so that's all my artwork on the walls here. We just kind of did a remodel and painted the walls pink and bought new store fixtures and things like that. So we have just really cool things in the gallery. Uh, a lot of different artists have prints here and postcards. Um, you know, concha pillows. I don't know where else you're gonna find pan dulce pillows um, and cool t-shirts and things like that from a lot of local artists and stuff, but this is our gallery wall. And so all of these artists here, um, like look at this one, is that, this is a 13 year old that did this piece right here. Um, so yeah, it's just, we're honored that we're able to um, support our community, um, give voice to our community, and then, um, you know, so Napatla, real quick, is an Aztec word that means the space in between. 
So through colonization, you know, different oppression models, um, folks that are marginalized say um, culturally, like I'm not quite Mexican enough for Mexico. I'm not quite American enough for um, America. I'm in that Nepotla state. I'm in between. Um, it could be with queer identity. It can be with um, gender norms. Um, being in that Nepotla state and kind of in between two worlds. But in that Nepotla state is where we heal, we rejuvenate, we create. And that's what we do here at the Nepotla Cultural Arts Gallery. Um, it's a community space. It's a welcoming space for the other. And so we hope that you will join us at the Nepotla Cultural Arts Gallery. We're um, right on the border of White Center in West Seattle. So if you know where Fresh Flowers Coffee on Del Ridge is, or Lee's Produce, we're literally across the street from Lee's Produce and next door to um, Fresh Flowers Coffee. So I hope you come and join us. And um, thank you so much um, for listening to me. And um, I look forward to hearing from the other artists. So thank you. Thank you, Jake. And thank you for that uh, view of the gallery. I haven't gotten a chance to see it in person, unfortunately, but I'm glad that I get to see it virtually, at the very least. Um, all right, next up, Tatiana, let me bring up that, let me share my screen, Hold on. where'd it go, there it is, this one, okay, and then we're going to go to the next, here it is, okay, so hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us tonight, um, I'm, I was really excited to be a part of the show because of the element of community, uh, involved in just even coming together for COCA to, to ask not just for artists, but for the communities. Um, I thought it was really wonderful and Jake seeing your presentation and hearing uh, what Neplanta is all about. I really, it really reinforces that for me. So thank you everyone. Um, so my name is Tatiana Garmendia and I was born in Cuba. So I'm I definitely get that Neplanta state because when you're an immigrant, you're never, you know, <laughs> you're not from the old world, from your old home anymore, and you're never going to be from the new world. And I'm an American citizen. I feel very lucky to uh, have gotten it. Um, we know right now that there are just thousands upon thousands of people waiting at the border. Uh, some of them children separated. I was very fortunate when I came to this country, we were given political asylum. We were not torn from uh, my parents and put in jails. We were accepted. Um, so I, I came here to this country as a young girl and growing up, I, I was also an other in the fact that I didn't see myself represented in media. I didn't see myself represented in the stories and histories I was learning. Certainly not Latinx, but also women, <laughs> because that also features very strongly in the work that I am doing and in the piece that is in this show, um, Las Mariposas. So my, my work is really influenced by that dual experience. So being born in Cuba, I grew up in uh, a, a religion that is not known in the US so much, um, Santeria, which is a syncretic religion that mixes uh, Yoruba animism with uh, Catholic uh, saints. It, the slaves like hid their beliefs uh, from the um, Spanish oppressors that way. And the religion has survived, and, and that's what, how I grew up. And one of the things about this is that you have very strong identity with these archetypal deities. And that, that as I grew up and I, I went out into the world and I studied, I majored in fine arts, but I've always had a great deal of interest in psychology. And I discovered Carl Jung and his work with archetypes, and I realized that it's not just something that is an expression of, of the African diaspora, which made its way to uh, the Caribbean and to Latin America in, in, um, in these religious forms, but um, that is something universal. The archetype 
we all share these myths. We all share these images. And in my studio, I think of myself as a visual union in that I explore the idea of identity um, as a kind of hybrid representation. And I centralize, I'm figurative, so I centralize the body in myths and I express them in my own body and in my, in my studio practice. And just for the last few years, I've been specifically working on this series um, that I call the Alchemical or Alchemical Bride series. And what got me started with that is that I was doing some reading in, in Jungian psychology and he sees the bride, this image of the bride, as um, an ar archetype for the union of the light and the shadow in the self. So a uh, fully human realized. And I was like, well, that's rich because here... <laughs> <laughs> we're living in the middle of the hashtag me too moment where all these stories there, there isn't a single woman and if you have any significant woman in your life you, you you will have known that there isn't a single woman that either directly or indirectly hasn't experienced some kind of physical or sexual uh, oppression you know it just it just happens uh, so never never mind the racial or the ethnic just gender, your biology just predisposes you in this particular society, in this particular time, and not just in this time, but throughout um, patriarchy as, you know, you're just going to be beat on. And, and I was like, well, that's really interesting. And I started to do research and I found out that the alchemists who were, so if, if you think about alchemy as proto-science, the idea of working with chemicals to try and raise base um, material into something higher. It's a metaphor for the spirit, for the being, as we're always trying to raise ourselves, to individuate, to become higher and more fully realized. And I saw that in their language, as they were transmuting, say, lead into gold, they talked about the house of chick and the womb. <laughs> and this is their language for the vessels that transform base material into you know something miraculous and i was like oh wow i really like this play of words um, because it centers the act of transformation in the female body which in our culture um is really um disregarded and so it seemed really critical for me to as a counterpart to the me too which calls attention to how we are um discounted culturally as a counterpart to that do some kind of research and create a new painting language that celebrated all the amazing women across all these different cultures across time across space all these women that i never found out about and, you know, it's sad to say I'm a teaching artist. That's not sad to say. I'm a teaching artist. I've been teaching at Seattle Central College for 27 years. And even now, like, just a, even a couple years ago, I was mentoring a new faculty member, a young man, and in his presentations, he didn't show us. He showed two female artists, everybody else. I had asked him, please include women in your presentations. You know, women have been artists. He, he showed two, <laughs> two works. One did not have a name, so the students never found out who this woman artist was. And then the other, the representation that he chose was one in which the woman artist was centering men and not women. So the woman was serving food to a man. And I was like, <laughs> well, this is really interesting. So I was like, okay, no, I didn't grow up knowing all these amazing women. I'm going to do this. And what I'm doing now is what we can see in this diptych, Las Mariposas, is I'm trying to occupy these bastions of, of painting, of modernist painting that have been very um, flat-footed, uh, almost misogynistic. So Cubism is really famous, like Picasso famously said women are either goddesses or um, placemats, you know, <laughs> like, all right. 
um, cubism, pop art, and then I'm doing feminist uh, revisionism. And what I do is I form little solar houses, little houses of chick or wombs with mirrors. And I cut out images of brides and I put them in there and I work with the distortions and then I paint that. Um, and this particular diptych celebrates two of four sisters. So there's two more canvases that I'm gonna do. The Mirabal sisters, which are known commonly um, as Las Mariposas. And they were um, activists who worked against the dictator Trujillo. And they were, uh, three of the sisters were in fact assassinated. They were first jailed um, and eventually there was enough of an outcry um, from the world. Um, and they're known as national heroes and they're also um, feminist symbols, you know, so, so they, they go beyond national interests. Um, and um, so they're really central to Dominican history. So they're, and, but to all Latin American history, and they're also really central to women's histories, that these women stood up against uh, injustice and stood up against, um, and, and died for their, for their work, for the work that they were doing. So this is the work that I've been up for. I don't have, <laughs> I don't have an easy way <laughs> to turn around and show you more work. And I, I, I didn't realize I could prepare a slideshow. So I, I really invite you to go on my website or to um, visit me on Instagram. I'm currently working towards a solo show. So almost on a daily basis, I'm posting works in progress and new works. And I'm looking at the history of the world across all times and across different disciplines. Um, the very first recorded doctor in history is an Egyptian woman. Did you know that? I didn't either <laughs> until I did research. The very first chemist recorded in history was from, um, some, the, from Sumner. So the area that is now Iraq, Iran. I never would have known that except for this history. The woman who discovered dark matter coming forward, an American woman, didn't know that, didn't know that. The woman who discovered that the sun is, and all the stars are made out of helium and not the base metal that our planets, you know, iron and, and other metals that are made, that they're actually made of these gases, was a woman and her male teacher told her to take it off her thesis or she wouldn't graduate and then he took her research, published it and, it, and got the credit. Fortunately, everybody knew. And she, you know, she got the credit in terms of she got her work, she got her teaching job at Harvard. She went on to publish hundreds of books. So the, the thing is, is this is the work that I'm doing. I'm doing a new language with my painting, trying to bring to light and rediscover how women have been transforming the base material of the lives that we are given, the culture that we are given, and we, we still rise up and we create something remarkable. And that's, that's what I'm up to. I hope I didn't go too long. <laughs> You're fine. Thank you so passion. much. No, passion always, always appreciated. Um, Michelle, you are then up next. Let me pull up your slideshow and switch over. Very fast. Here. And then. How do I make it present? That is another question. You could just do view as slideshow. Oh, let's see. There it is. Easiest way. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. So yeah, thank you. Um, thanks to Nat and Coca for this opportunity. I'm really honored to be in the company of Tatiana and Jake and the other artists in the show. And um, so, um, and thanks so much for making this happen since 
we have to having to um, pivot a lot. <laughs> um, I'm a three and a half generation Japanese American, born and raised in Seattle, and I studied at, um, illustration at the School of Visual Arts in New York. Um, I worked as a graphic artist at the Seattle Times for over a decade. And then more recently, um, I served as the exhibit director at the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience for 12 years. So um, let's see, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm influenced by heritage, identity, and legacy, and my work focuses on stories of Nikkei, um, which is uh, the Japanese diaspora. Next slide, please. And so this is a, the piece that's in the show. It's called Song for Generations. Um, so in 2019, I was invited to be in a group show curated by Alicia B. Johnson for the Bellwether Arts Festival. And I found out that our work would be displayed in Bellevue City Hall. So I wanted to focus on the Bellevue Japanese American Farmer story, um, which is almost invisible, but also a very significant local history. So before World War II, there were 60 Japanese American farms in the Bellevue area, including the site where Bellevue City Hall is currently located. And so I wanted to make this work very large to amplify this story that very few people know of. So I painted this piece and it's made up of three canvases. Each is um, measures eight feet wide um, by five feet tall. And the three panels reference a Japanese scroll that's been sectioned. So it shows how culture and tradition and identity change and fragment with progressive generations. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is a top panel and that references immigration, labor, and survival. Um, you can see two cranes flying over the rising sun and waves of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and these farmers have uh, cleared the land of trees and stumps, and they're trying to make fertile ground to grow produce. Um, next slide, please. And the middle panel symbolizes the incarceration experience. Um, the pain, internalization, resilience, and endurance of the Japanese American community. So during and after World War II, many Nikkei families lost their land and faced rampant racism, uh, which was fed by wartime hysteria. Persons of Japanese ancestries uh, were told to pack only what they could carry when they were forcibly removed from the West Coast. One of the leading proponents of the Japanese American incarceration was Miller Freeman, a prominent businessman and founder of the Anti-Japanese League of Washington. So during World War II, Japanese Americans um, lost the farmland they owned or leased, and then the land was available for development. So Freeman and a number of large real estate companies benefited from the Japanese Americans' loss and the former Japanese American farmland became now um, what we know as um, downtown Bellevue. Um, and in this image, you'll see this, the strawberries falling out of an open suitcase and the blue star mother's flag, which signifies Japanese Americans who served in the US military while their families were incarcerated. And this burning house represents loss and psychological trauma. Next slide, please. And the third panel represents the legacy of the incarceration and the future of younger generations. And you can see the falling strawberries, they turn into children and the barbed wire um, forms the US flag and appears in the mouths of two Nikkei who have found their voice to speak out against injustice, past and present and a young girl gives flight to a paper crane or tsudu, which is a symbol of peace and hope. Um, and uh, it's hard to explain the whole history, but if you're interested, um, next slide, please. 
Um, there's a great book by David Neewert called Strawberry Days, How Internment Destroyed a Japanese American Community um, that really goes more in depth in that history. Um, so through my work, I'm hoping to connect history with the present. Um, and these stories are powerful tools that parallel current issues of immigration, racism, and culture. Um, so um, thank you for joining this program and for your time. Thank you to all of you. See everybody's face. Thank you everyone for sharing about your personal art, about um, your artistic practice and your pieces. Um, very much appreciated. Um, I'd like to next start off with a couple of questions that I was just writing down while um, you guys were talking and things that I've been thinking about um, in relation to this exhibition. Um, uh, and this question uh, is for the entire group, but uh, Seattle very proudly claims its kind of liberal uh, title and its accepting title of, uh, you know, all people, all races, gender expressions, things like that. Um, but I have a question for the three of you is that, uh, unfortunately, BIPOC communities, other marginalized communities are still often painted with these very broad brushes, very broad strokes. Um, so I was just wondering if you guys had any like particular nuances that you would like to see in the Seattle arts community um, in, order to, in, in order for it to become not only more diverse, but more inclusive of artists who um, fall outside of dominant culture. Uh, I, I can start it off. Um, so it, it, when I moved back from LA, I think that's when it really hit me. Um, the, the feeling of being othered. Um, in like if you're I tell people like if you're Latinx in LA you it's probably what white folks feel like around the rest of the country you're the default you know kind of people in the community like you can go to like a regular like Safeway type grocery store and they have pan dulce in their bakery you can go to a and pm and they have cafe de olla you know you can go um, you know, just the like grocery store parking lot and there's a woman selling tamales and your a paletero walks by every day in front of your house and you can get your elotes, you know, again, just walk by your house. Um, and I'm very pale. I'm, I, I, I white passing. And, but in LA, no one ever questioned my Latino-ness there it was just like you're here you you know you must be latino like it i think it was like even like uh you know if you're african-american or um you know white you know there it would be more of a shock like what you're not latino oh okay i just assumed you were um and it wasn't until i moved back that i got the oh you don't look mexican again and i was like oh i forgot about that <laughs> like um, I forgot how we're othered here and, uh, you know, and, oh, tacos. I love tacos. That's your people. Like, oh, I, you know, it's like, wow, you don't hear that. Like, it's just, um, so one, I think we're, we live like people of color live this hyphenated existence. Our food is Mexican food. You know, our art is you know, Mexican art, it, like we're, we live a hyphenated existence. It's not just art, it's not just food. Um, so we have to contend with that. Um, you know, for myself, I guess I've kind of created a bubble more or less. And when we were creating this kind of art scene in kind of East LA, it was kind of in contrast to this, you know, white, you know, art scene that was happening in West LA that didn't include people of color, weren't interested in us unless it was um, to kind of tokenize us. And we were just kind of like, well, F it. Like our, our um, what would you call it? Like 
we don't base ourselves or and kind of categorize our art based on your acceptance. So we created our own scene in our own communities for our own people in mind. Like I wanted the viejitas, like the old ladies to come to my art show, right? Like I wanted community to be there. Um, so we put on these art shows that were the same caliber, the same talent, the, you know, the same effort. We didn't shortchange folks, but we created this free art experience for community that was engaging people in art. We, um, there were people that I worked with that started this thing called the Mobile Mural Lab, where they basically bought a panel truck, whitewashed it, and then would invite artists to come like draw on a mural. And then you would take that, you know, truck to a community like outside a church or, you know, South Central LA, you know, and have all the paints and ev brushes and everything ready. And you just invite community to paint that mural in. It engages community directly in the arts. So it wasn't like trying to get into their scene. It was about creating our own scene. Um, and I think, you know, that's when I moved back to Seattle, I think I brought that with me, this idea of I'm not trying to value myself on someone else's expectations or someone else's notions. I'm creating, I see a need in our community. I see a community of BIPOC folk that need voice in, in Seattle. And I'm just trying to create a space where we can amplify those voices that are not being heard. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to um, answer that question as well? Yeah, um, I'm going to pipe in and say, um, so I, I agree that it's really vitally important that we not just rely on the gatekeepers, the traditional gatekeepers, um, because they're not necessarily going to open the door, except for those tokenized moments. I can't begin to tell you how many times all you have to do is look at my resume. You see a lot of like, well, you know, it's Hispanic month. <laughs> so I'm going to be <laughs> in this show. Um, and, you know, after a while, I was like, no, give somebody else a chance. Um, because it's, it's very predictable. You start to see the same names. Um, I, I certainly have experienced this phenomenon where in the East Coast, anywhere. So I'm not just talking uh, New York or Miami, where I've been, but anywhere on the East Coast, anybody will, everybody recognizes that I'm not white. <laughs> you know, they just know. Um, and it's not just, okay, so now I look like a mushroom because Seattle doesn't see enough sun. Uh, but it's not just that. It's, there's an understanding. Latinx, it's like, we're a lot of different countries. We're a lot of, and Mexican, this idea of what a Mexican looks like is a very narrow and highly indigenous image, right? And we don't all look like that. We come from many different countries and we don't just have indigenous, we have African. <laughs> Uh, and yes, there's a, you know, there was deracination. The Europeans were there. We all got, we're all mixed, which is why when I came to this country, we were always brown. <laughs> that was like the thing you got to check in the census. And now they have all these different uh, ways in which we get split up. So I do think that we don't necessarily need to depend on the gatekeepers, but I also think the gatekeepers need to be held accountable. Um, and I, you know, I recently went to an event um, at Wanawari Zoom event, Black Lunch Table and People's Table. And one of those questions that we were talking about is how do we, how do we get uh, property? You know, Michelle, you're talking about how those farms were taken, you know? How, how do you get empowered? Well, in the United States, you get empowered with money. <laughs> <laughs> so property, so artists have to be able to own property and not just always be paying somebody else's mortgage. I think artists, um, for us to really exist, so you can open a center like you have and then get monies maybe through Shunpike or for culture, 
Um, but that's not always going to be the case that somebody has the skills or the knowledge to be able to. I mean, those are you. I would be a disaster just even balancing <laughs> the books, right? I would be a disaster doing that. So people, not everybody has the capacity to also administer a business like that, but artists of color need to have a collector base and a gallery base. Every single gallery that has represented my work in Seattle, and I moved here in 1993 from the East Coast. So every single gallery that has represented my work, four of them, didn't just represent my work, they represented all kinds of artists. They clearly looked beyond the typical white Pacific Northwest art and every single one of them closed. Why? Why? Because they couldn't pay the bills, right? And they were for profit. So I think that we need to hold all of the corporations that you know, get tax write-offs and have their corporate art collections, we need to hold them accountable. They need to be buying our art. They need to buy our art. And you forgive me, Jake, when was the last time you saw a Latinx artist at Sam that wasn't making poor, poor Fulgencio? He's like forever the guy who they ask him to draw for the Day of the Dead, to do the sand paintings. Like we're there to entertain, but we don't get the gallery space. You know what I'm saying? So I think I, feminist me, I take a, a page from the Gorilla Girls, and I think BIPOC artists need to create some kind of anonymous action group. So because we, if we're asking the gatekeepers to let us in, we can't be confronting them directly because then they get pissed off. <laughs> Pardon my language, right? So some way that we can anonymously go in and like bomb them, you know, bomb them with like paper, pamphlets, you miss the target. Where are the BIPOC artists in your collection? Where are the BIPOC artists in your show? How come it, how come it takes Coca? <laughs> who else is doing this, right? I mean, yay, Coca, you're doing this, but who else is doing this, right? So that's, so I think it's a door that we can't depend on them but we also can't let them off the hook. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, Michelle, did you want to add anything or else I can just scoot into another question? Um, yeah. Oh, you're, you're muted. Oh, can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, you can go scoot into another oh, question yeah. if you want gotcha. your time short. Gotcha, yeah. So um, I have a question for you specifically. Um, so, Portraits are a recurring theme within your work. So I was just wondering, is there, did you um, ha have anyone in your life who uh, was a major influence on your career as an artist? Um, who's maybe represented in your work or uh, serves as inspiration? Um, let's see, for, I had like a few, there were a few local Asian American artists that served as like kind of mentors um that were really encouraging um for um and inspiring me inspiring me to pursue art and so there was frank fuji who was a graphic artist um amy mikatani who was a fine artist and alan lau who's another fine artist and poet um and i you know i feel lucky to have had those mentors and i think that it's so important for BIPOC artists to see other artists who look like them um, to help encourage them and empower them. Um, um, in terms of um, the art influence, um, and you were talking about portraits. And, mm -hmm. it um, just yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I like to use portraits because I feel like, um, I want to always have an, a human element in my work and including a portrait or a person is a way to draw the viewer in and then connect them to a personal story um, and create empathy. And so that as, the, as they're drawn in, it's not just an ethnic story, it's a human story. 
Um, so that's, um, and I think that also comes from my work at uh, Wing Sam, where, you know, um, we really focused on personal stories, um, which would connect a broad audience still, even though it was um, Asian Pacific focus, it, it connected to everybody. So that's what I'm hoping to do with my work. Thank you for sharing. Um, another question connected to uh, to portraits for Jake. Um, a lot, you also fe feature a lot of um, humans and people in your work. And I was just wondering like where, how you generate those faces, if those are people from your, your life, people you know, amalgamations of different people you may know or you're using um, online resources. But I'm just wondering a little bit about your process and like. Uh, yeah, um, so I, I would say about 98% of the people in my paintings are real people. Um, I basically just use family and friends. So I'll have an idea for a painting and I will just kind of, you know, think of who I know that kind of would work great for that idea and uh, send my friend or family member a message like, hey, I have this idea for a painting, would you be down to model? And then um, if they're close by, I'll just like, hey, I just need to get a picture of you real quick. and. And I just use that as my reference image. So, um, you know, I'll just print out a, kind of a full size or full page um, image and kind of tape that to the canvas. And, um, you know, sometimes I'll project it onto the canvas and trace it out or, you know, just kind of freehand it. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I think the only ones that really aren't necessarily real people are the Aztec like codice style pieces that I've done, which um, is a series where I'm looking at like, you know, basically asking the question, if we were still doing the codices like our ancestors, what would they look like today? So I'm just trying to capture, you know, community in the style, like these hieroglyphic style art. And so what I'll just like the palatero, a girl taking a selfie of herself, uh, I did like graduating, you know, two graduating um, students and, um, you know, college student, a girl on her laptop, um, an artist, like just different things, just different things you would see in your own community, but in the style of our ancestors. So those ones, you know, I just kind of hand drawn, um, not really uh, real people, um, but pretty much all my oil paintings, um, you know, friends and family. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for, I was just burning questions. Thank you for answering <laughs> that. I appreciate it. Um, and then uh, for Tatiana, um, you talked, um, I was wondering, I had a question about your um, Alchemical Bride series. Um, is you're con planning on continuing that going forward and including much more, um, you know, feminist icons from different periods and histories. And uh, you spoke about how there's an erasure of you know, female artists throughout history. People often think, you know, like representation is the answer, it's the fix all. You see more people on the screen and, um, you know, that'll make, that make change. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on like, uh, you know, representation is important, but what is also the supporting things that you need to do on top of representing? Oh, it's a very complex question, and I don't know that I have an answer. I know what I do in my in my own practice. Like now, I'm I've I've already spent two years just doing that, uh, and I and I have enough. You know, I cut, I cut out. I'm a Cuban. I can't help it. I'm obsessive. <laughs> I cut out over a thousand brides, so I figure I have to uncover at least a thousand women who have been forgotten. Uh, or whose, whose uh, accomplishments have been erased because in many cases, they have literally been removed from the cultural canon um, just, just to get rid of us, you know, just to get rid of us. So, I, yes, I will be doing this for a while. Um, I have to say that, so I do that in my, in my studio practice, but in my academic practice because I'm a teaching artist I really see it as social it's a, a social service you know um, I raise the issue in my classes <laughs> I center the work of BIPOC artists and women artists and 
all my presentations. Uh, now, of course, we have, we're working online. One of the things I do is I teach figure drawing and I am always looking for artists for models of color to take away, you know, people are afraid, <laughs> you know, they're afraid of, of people of color and they're specifically afraid of African American men. That's it, you know, there's a reason we have a Black Lives Matter because we need, we need that awakening, right? And people are afraid and I figure if you just have a living, breathing human being in front of you raised up on a pedestal that you're gonna draw and you're gonna paint, that's already telling you that they are monumentalized. They're important. And now that we are on online, I have to find online resources. And it's interesting, just this very day, I got hit by, um, by a, um, an online resource. They do online videos that is free for everyone. And they realize that teachers are using their resource because now we can no longer have a model in front of us. Um, and they're, they're uh, starting to get us for copyright infringement. But I go to them because they have models of all different body sizes and of all different uh, ethnicities and colors that a lot of the other ones just show you dancers and white dancers, <laughs> you know? And it's like, well, come on, man. There's human. Humans come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. And so that's one of the ways that I, I think it's not just representation, but to center the story um, and center the discussion. You know, we make it a point of discussion in the classes. And, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm pretty sure that people my generation and older, maybe like if you're not awake now, you're never going to be awake. But at least there's a chance <laughs> with a younger generation. Um, so that, that's how I do it. I think, I think there's got to be something else. I think, of course, you know, I mean, it, 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 talk, it talks to our basic freedoms. Can we say, um, you know, that's a discussion we've been having. We have these terms like heroic rape in art history books that show us, you know, rape presented as a, an heroic part of history. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what should this be canceled? The way that, you know, look, look at all the people who are, who are coming forth and talking about like cancel culture. It's like, that's just culture, man. Get rid of that. Get rid of that racist shit. Why should, why is it even still around? It's on public, it's on a public ground, <laughs> right? So, I mean, I think that having those discussions in the public domain is just as vital as passive representation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think putting people in, in the positions of power, I think having directors who are people of color, curators who are people of color, directors, who are people of color, producers who are people of color, right? Mm -hmm. Bankers <laughs> who loan to people of color, right? So, yeah. Like it. Thank you. Um, we are running a little bit short on time now, so I will send my most sincere thank yous to all of our participating artists. You are, you know, you make this possible. We can't do any of this without you. So appreciated that you took the time out to speak with us and to allow yourself to be recorded so that we can hopefully show this to, um, you know, to more people. And sorry, I'm knocking this stuff over. <laughs> uh, we can get this out to as many people as possible and everyone and to provide uh, space for people to just say what they're feeling in their own words. Um, I will do a final plug to uh, Nepantla to each of your personal websites will have a list of resources that we'll be posting in the um, Facebook group. I've been taking notes on some of the uh, places you've told us to check out to make sure that people can see these and um, have easy access to them. Um, but if we still have time left in our exhibition, Not Your Monolith, unfortunately the gallery is physically closed until the 15th of January, but we have all of the beautiful pieces included in our exhibition available online through our virtual viewing room, also installation photos so you can see um, the way that they are laid out together. 
Um, I want to say thank you to Royal Alley Barnes, our executive director, for being here. And um, I think I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning, but my name is Nat Thornton, and I am the curator here at the Center on Contemporary Art. Forgot that part. I got very uh, excited about this presentation, but I would just like to say um, thank you uh, for all of your work and your, your trust in us to present your work. And, and your brilliance. Thank yes. you so much.